I look at the future of places quite often. So cities, towns, cities, regions, countries. So what will their economy look like in 10, 20, 30 years? How do they grow? How do they create new types of business, new jobs? How do they house more people? How do they, basically, how does a place evolve in a way that it, it has a sustainable economic base? What kinds of industries would be present in the future? Is it the existing industries, but they've evolved and developed? Is it new industries? How big are they? How small are they? And what kind of ingredients do we need to put into place to make that happen? Mm. Infrastructure, labor market, skills, education. Sometimes it's about marketing a place so that it draws in investment. A lot of our work is also about specific elements in developing a place, a so new infrastructure, transport, energy, utilities, water, digital infrastructure. Before we design that, how do we make the case to invest in it? So we do a lot of work around what's called business case. So you make the case for investment, particularly if you need to go to the government to invest in a big bit of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. How do we make the case that the benefit outweighs the cost? What are the benefits? And these are the individual ingredients to create the economic future of a place. So have you got involved or would you have got involved with something around the HS2 rail link? Yeah, WSP does a lot of work on HS2 Yeah, in terms of engineering and planning. So that has been a big project for WSP. I'm not really personally involved in it myself, but we would do, the company would do a lot around the engineering and the planning and even things like landscape development landscape solutions to the new line. We also do a lot of work around engagement because it's such a huge project. It involves so many different stakeholders and communities. There's mm. a need to engage mm. constantly. And we have a big function in WSP that does that community engagement, stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. So there would be a lot of big projects, the kind of bread and butter of WSP. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes we're involved in those things, sometimes not. And in previous firms, I've been involved in the early stages of what was called Crossrail, now the Elizabeth Line. Yep. So quite a long time ago, the firm I was with then, we looked at the regenerative impacts of Crossrail as it was being planned before it was really being constructed in order that the... Uh, the, the policies were put in place to try and maximise the benefits in particular locations. So we do a lot of work around that. We, if the, the government is already on the path of investing in major infrastructure because there's a need, say, for connectivity improvements, my team would look at, OK, if this is coming, then how do we maximise the economic impact and the social impact and the impact on a kind of sustainable future pathway so that it's not just a big physical pr project, it becomes something which is economically and societally beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what is the thing that you're working on at the moment? Well, many, the, many things. What's the exciting thing that you're working on the at the moment? The exciting thing. Interesting project in Greater Manchester looking at net zero affordable housing. We do a lot of work around housing. We've done a lot of work for Homes England looking at how, how Homes England and other agencies can help local authorities to accelerate housing delivery. At net zero specifically or just general? Just general. So, the, so okay. the, the problem starts with housing at all. Yep. Just getting housing yep. is a big challenge for all sorts of reasons. Some to do with how the planning process operates or the capacity of planning. Sometimes it's about land values, viability issues, all sorts of things. A lot of it quite often is just around the politics of new housing. Mm. It's a highly politicized thing. So we've done a lot of work helping think through how to make the case for housing, how to provide more capacity, particularly to local planning authorities to facilitate the delivery of housing. So there's just getting housing <laughs> at all is then we get to think about affordable housing. OK, this is even more of a challenge. There are lots of policies in place, but how do we make it work both as a policy instrument, but also a, as part of a commercial housing project? We also look at the role of the public sector as a provider of housing and how that can work. And then we get to net zero housing. So we need housing, I talk, you know, housing mm. per se, mm. affordable housing, mm. net zero affordable housing. So this is mm. this becomes even more challenging. So can I start at the beginning then of that process when yep. you said housing, just getting housing, mm. is a bit of a political you didn't use the word hot potato, but yep. am I am it's I incorrect in using that word? <laughs> Not really. No, <laughs> okay. okay. And as we're recording this, we are up in the air, shall we say, yeah. in terms of yeah. what government is going to be running the country yeah. from the 4th of July onwards. Yeah. 
What barriers are in the way mm-hmm. that you <clears throat> see and feel and your team know easily removable if people would just get on better? There are some practical issues around delivering housing. You know, there's the availability of land, how serviceable that land is with existing infrastructure. What do you mean by so, serviceable, the land? So does it, pre- is it connected? Does it have power? Does it have water? Yeah. Is that possible? Is it in the floodplain? Yep. You know, all of these practical things have to be addressed. And of course, there's a, there's a cost to that. Where it becomes, and these things are addressable because quite often it's a practical, technical solution, which mm-hmm. may be very expensive, but you can identify what the solution is. You have these issues, and then on top of that, you get how people feel about new housing coming into their community and how they personally see that and how they might experience it. And then it's into issues like, you know, what happens on the roads, congestion, what happens to GP surgeries, there's more demand for GPs, etc. What happens to local schools? People have legitimate concerns about these types of things and also things like access to green space, all sorts of things. And the challenge is to make the case, and this is some of the work that we've been doing, that delivering new housing can address all of these things if it's done in the right way. So again, there are solutions to how you plan for healthcare services, how you plan for education, how you plan for the management of green space, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people blame the planning system. The planning system is broken. I don't adhere to that view at all. I don't think the planning system is broken. The planning system is a system and by definition will be imperfect. One of the big problems we have is the capacity of the planning system, particularly on the public sector side. There are just not enough planners in the system to facilitate the processes. And these processes involve addressing all of these issues that people have, and also an ability to negotiate with developers, with landowners, to just move things forward, move projects forward in the right way. And if you don't have the capacity there to do that, things just slow down. It's the same with, you know, when you look at renewable energy and you look at things like, you know, onshore wind for example, it takes the one of the biggest challenges is just to get the whole thing through the planning process. And again, it's because there are technical issues around capacity, the physical capacity of places. And then you get come into all of these kind of socio political challenges about how people feel about these things coming into their community. And these all have to be addressed by experts in the system. And if you don't have enough experts in the system, everything slows down. And sometimes things. So are you stop. saying that the system's not broken? It's the, the system doesn't have the capacity. I think for sure the system doesn't have the capacity. So it's, you know, of course it could be improved. There could be reforms which improve the planning system, of course. But you could probably go quite a long way just by having more capacity in the current system, mm-hmm. I think. I mean, the other thing that I do as well as working at WSP, I'm also a professor at Westminster University. So I do quite a lot of teaching and I teach economics, economic development, mainly to people who will hopefully become planners, hopefully. <laughs> I'm trying to persuade them that economics is important, think about economics. But, and, you know, there are kind of people coming through, young people who are realistic and they're committed and they're engaged in it. And, but we want them to really ideally be going into public sector side of planning. A lot of people start in the public sector and then they go into the private sector because salaries are a bit higher and maybe people see a different type of career progression. So there are quite a lot of challenges. I think a lot of capacity was taken out of local authorities in general, planning departments, every department, and it's never really gone back in, I think. So the system struggles to take things forward, mm. I think. What is there that you think that universities or maybe even the government departments can do to try and attract people either back into the public departments or keep them once they're in there? Well, I think there is a challenge around how young people understand the planning profession or the economic development profession, the part of the profession that I'm in, and how they see that as as a you know an interesting, challenging career option. So there's getting people into the, the, the kind of training and the profession to begin with, and then there's trying to keep them in the system. I mean, it's it's difficult because local authorities are just very fiscally, financially stretched. A lot of local authorities have major financial problems. You know, we see bankrupt local authorities. So it's very difficult. I think there could be a lot more done in terms of just communicating what these kinds of careers involve, not just for young people, but people who are already in the labour market who might be thinking about, you know, a career switch or, you know, doing something else. And this is something that's quite 
neglected, I think, because if we look at the transition to net zero, it's all about it's, you know, everything changes. The way the labor market functions changes, types of jobs that are available will change. Some jobs disappear, some jobs become, you know, vital to the process. But we're not doing enough to understand who of those people already in work, who could you know, change, who could transition, who could with a certain degree of kind of transition based training, education, who could, you know, who could make the difference, who could do this. There's a lot of emphasis on young people and it's correct to do that, but we need to take a broader perspective, I think, on on how new roles in industries like planning, like construction, could be filled. You know, who's mm. you know, how do we transform people into the kind of you know, people who could do these different jobs? I'd like to talk about the skills gap that yeah. we've got mm. a bit a little bit later on in the conversation, but yeah. just particularly staying with the the private versus public sector. Yeah. What three things would you say that someone needs to consider when moving away from the public into the private sector that may persuade them mm-hmm. to stay in the public sector? There's certainly something around how you make a difference, I think. And of course, you can make a difference societally in the private sector. I like to think we, we do, me and my team. But maybe in the public sector, there's maybe possibly more of an impact there. It's also probably something that takes you closer to the community, community interests, you know, just seeing what people are dealing with in local areas, whether they're residents or businesses, etc. There's probably, it used to be the case that there was more flexibility in the public sector in terms of work-life balance, etc. Because things are so stretched now, I don't know if that's still the case. I mean, people in the public sector work extremely hard as they do in the private sector, so I think maybe there isn't the same kind of flexibility there. Although I do see people in the public sector maybe working from home more than in the private sector, so maybe there's still a bit of... As we go forward... I would like to think that, you know, as the economy improves, which hopefully it will do, and you know, and we grow, and eventually the government of the day, whoever it is, has more fiscal room to spend on things like regeneration, urban regeneration. You know, we, you know, in the late 90s into the noughties, there was a lot of big urban regeneration, particularly in northern cities and in London. And it would be nice to think there would be a wave of that coming again in the future particularly as we try to decarbonize. So being in the public sector, maybe you're closer to you know, the policy design, the decision making, accessing funding. You know, the day-to-day role is you know, delivering the regeneration agenda in, mm-hmm. in a place. And there's still places in the country that, that need to be regenerated. You know, the, the previous wave, we see a lot of regeneration in Glasgow and Manchester and Leeds. You know, there are places, coastal communities, for example, that still need that kind of physical and economic and social regeneration. So hopefully at some point in the future, there will be another wave of this. You have to be optimistic, I think. Yeah. It's interesting. I've, I've never considered that before, that, that there would be another significant wave of, of, of government spending around infrastructure mm-hmm. and around regeneration. Well, the current government has had for quite a long time a policy of levelling up and to my mind we've been trying to level up for about 40 years now really since the UK deindustrialized. so that hasn't gone away as a as a need there's still a huge imbalance economically between London and the south and you know places like Bradford well places like Bradford yeah. yes and you know other parts of the north of the country mm. and the Midlands and even in the southeast there's an imbalance you can mm. find places which are extremely wealthy do very well and places which are struggling mm. so there's still a need to level up the economy because if parts of the economy don't aren't reaching their full potential then the, the whole national economy suffers you know there's mm. capacity that can be generated there so I don't think leveling up leveling up may change its name may be called something else but the principal objective will remain and at some, you know that involves physical change new infrastructure you know changing buildings mm. making them more sustainable decarbonizing them so these mm. things are, are going to have to continue somehow i think so eventually we'll see a wave of i think hopefully you know the next the next generation of regeneration projects mm. hopefully Mm. Yeah, I've I've seen that same thing. I, I think for as long as I can remember hearing a politician speak, they've used a phrase like levelling up yeah. and there being the difference aggregated between the north and the south. 
So the strength of London as an international business centre, as a financial services centre, despite Brexit, continues. You know, you, that doesn't somehow get levelled off or flattened. That continues. That strength continues to pull in investment. I mean, arguably, we could be positioning London in an even stronger way, you know, as an even more important magnet to attract that investment. So that continues to happen. Places which struggle and have had and have struggled for a long time, again, these things can somehow reinforce each other. So I think there's a kind of natural tendency for strong places to just get even stronger economically. I think arguably, we also haven't invested enough in infrastructure outside of the south of the country. You know, we've had new infrastructure in London and the southeast. We've had Crossrail, Elizabeth Line. It's, you know, it's made a huge difference. It's very well used. It adds to, you know, a transport system that's already pretty, pretty good, good by yeah. international standards. Mm, yeah. If you go to the north of the country, you know, arguably, you know, if you were to connect Manchester, Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield with much stronger transport related infrastructure, you know, the boost there could be enormous, but it's, it hasn't happened. And is that a political blocker? Is it a local blocker where people are saying, I don't want this, these transport links coming through my town or through my city? There will always be a bit of that. There will always be a little bit of that everywhere you go. But you need to take a strategic perspective. You need to look at, you need to think about the country as a, a, a system of places that have to work in their own right, but also have to work in combination with each other. And if we look across the northern cities, for example, you've got a lot of big local authorities with kind of powerful, influential politicians who generally all want new investment to come in. I mean, they have to kind of agree as a collective group on the best way to do that and to make the case. And sometimes the challenge is to make the case based on I kind of pre the prescribed way of making the case for investment. I mean, uh, we do a lot of business case work and we use the, the Treasury's usual approach to business case. It's called the Green Book. For anyone out there who does business case, they'll know all about the Green Book. And for a long time, the criticism there was the, um, the benefits of investment were measured in terms of land value uplift, real estate value, etc. And those values are always bigger in the South than they are in the north. It's just the way the market works. So you tend to bias things towards the south of the country. You don't really properly consider the strategic impact that an investment might have somewhere else. That's changed a bit, but I think it needs to change more really in terms of how you make this, how you make a, a balanced strategic case for change. And it's not pure, just pure economic change. It's improving transport connectivity between northern cities has an economic benefit, but also the, you know, the social impact, the social value that can come through that is also very important, more difficult to measure and to quantify. But it's one that you kind of know it when you see it, mm. you know, and it's, mm. it's usually important to how these places function, not just these cities, but all the places in between and how we think about the future of places. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're still leveling up. We've never really properly invested in that kind of infrastructure it also doesn't help us that we have this this kind of model we've got one huge city right down in the southeast corner and then kind of every other city is kind of the same size and spread all over the place if we were more like germany and cities were all similar sizes and there wasn't one big dominant city then it might be a different story so that doesn't help us but that's also not an excuse for mm, not not, being not addressing these things i'm wondering what the impact of having a five-year government term being mm. in place of having that larger, bigger yeah. picture yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Because the government surely are only going to mm. plead to the people to try and get re-elected. But five years is really quite short in terms of yes. long, big projects that we're talking about here. It is, yes, it is. I mean, yeah, this the electoral cycle is also a complicating factor. Yeah, as it is in other countries. Mm. Yeah. Not, certainly not unique. Yeah, and that. I'm not for a second suggesting that we need to move to a, a, a dictatorship <laughs> and that will solve everyone's problems. Yeah. But I'm just talking here, and it's probably more from the from the voters' perspective, yeah. is that yeah. now as I'm considering how I'm going to vote and the discussion mm. is going around in my home about how we vote, yeah. very much the thinking is short term, it's not long term. Mm, yes, I mean, you, do, you can't achieve change without long term strategic planning and thinking that does tend to get trapped within electoral cycles, unfortunately. I mean, it's helpful if you have 
if you have electoral, so I guess if you have the same government over a number of cycles, that's helpful if they have the right policy. It's also about pragmatic government. It's not just national government, it's also local government. I mean, mm-hmm. I used to live in Manchester and Manchester's achieved an awful lot in terms of regeneration and economic development. It's a very vibrant city. When you go there, you feel the vibrancy. Well, that too. And I think one of the reasons for that is the very consistent political leadership. I mean, the same leaders actually for quite a long time, but also a consistent approach to leadership and a consistent approach to presenting the city as a place for investment or a place to live or a place to do business in a, again in a long term consistent way and also an ability to for you know to work with central government irrespective of who is in government again a consistent approach to working with the national government and that's paid huge dividends for Manchester when you look at what's happened there in terms of development and also things like the tram network in Manchester which is very extensive now that's huge investments mm-hmm. and a, a really good clever consistent case making and you need the equivalent of that thinking in terms of central government it probably takes quite the bold leadership i think and bold leaders and bold leadership and consistent consistent case you need to keep keep making the case i always say this when i talk to my clients about how do we get funding how do we make the case for this and how can we take this project forward and i always say okay you need to create a strong case for doing it and then you need to make the case to all the people who need to hear it and then you need to make the case again and again and again Mm. and and you don't stop Mm. until you get it Mm. you don't just make the case once and then hope that it happens you need to be consistent consistent and Mm. same message again and again same argument be clear about what the argument is and make sure the argument is you know technically correct Mm. And keep keep making it, keep mm. articulating the case. But it does need it does need strategic leadership. We work all over the world, and you know we work in places that have changed a lot. You know we places you can look at places like Dubai, like Singapore. They went from being you know, not much happening at all, and you know Singapore's case you know very damaged after the Second World War, and different form of government, but consistent strategy, long term consistent mm. strategy with key objectives which are about creating business destination, creating opportunity for investment, incentivizing investment in particular ways. Engineering a particular quality of life in the real estate, in the housing offer, in the buildings, in the malls, in the the leisure attractions. So there's a kind of an engineering of a place and you know that has positives and negatives, mm-hmm. it would have to be said. But that's done in order to to attract a kind of international business elite mm. really you know, from that region but from you know it's where you know Europe meets Asia in Dubai you know and it's it becomes a place a, a connecting place a meeting place you know if you want it's the place to have your regional headquarters mm-hmm. and again these things become self-reinforcing once it starts down that route and it starts to become the place of connectivity and business and trade and more people see it that way then it just gets bigger it snowballs you know, it just it does snowball yes and that's that's the kind of effect you know coming back to cities in the uk that's the kind of effect that we're trying to trying to catalyze here really put ingredients in place that start to generate new forms of business and that attracts more investment and the more clustering and mm. the skills base improves and you know it should it should become you know bigger so so with that in mind how can sustainable practices drive that the start of that snowball effect yeah yeah so the transition to net zero which is a legal obligation on the part of the government and the new government will inherit that legal obligation that becomes the basis for having to do things decarbonize transport decarbonize the built environment decarbonize energy the one that everybody forgets decarbonize agriculture and food production we always forget that one because what we eat and how we eat it a big impact on carbon so immediately it's you know the need to do things differently that then gets reinforced by the need for large private organizations to disclose where the carbon is in their operations or in their supply chain they have to publish disclosures they have to adhere to esg principles otherwise they will not attract investors from investment funds financial sources that need to see these credentials so everything again starts to snowball a little bit you're talking the likes of blackrock all large companies 
are either already having to do this or will have to do this, irrespective of where they are in the world. There's a bit of, there's a lot of complexity. Things are, the rules are a little bit different or the emerging rules are a bit different, different places, EU versus North America versus Asia, etc. So there's, there's an issue of what we call interoperability mm. of some of these ways of measuring things. But that will change behavior. It's already changing behavior. What, that, what needs to happen is that these kind of corporate moves need to start filtering down into how we plan projects, whether they're individual buildings or individual pieces of infrastructure, how we create and develop the workforce capable of implementing things, and then how that becomes impactful in terms of new jobs created, incomes going up, people getting different types of jobs, people's household incomes improving, people's welfare improving. So it's how those kind of top level corporate decisions start to filter down mm. into the ordinary lives of regular people like us, you know, as we go about our daily business. And that's where sustainability can drive change, I think. But it's it's sustainability as a systemic process that does change things as opposed to sustainability as a statement, you know, as, as a corporate brochure. Mm. It should be a real process of, you know, you should experience the change in your own life you're you know you should become more sustainable but you should also feel the benefit of it whether that's air quality improving or whether it's your house being retrofitted or you know you're able to get a different kind of job mm. Mm. and that job pays more than the one you already had yeah. and so how then would you measure the impact how do we measure the impact yeah okay well the way you measure something depends on the objectives that you've set in the first place so you know, with sustainability processes, I mean, one of the big objectives is to reduce carbon emissions, of course, to get to net zero carbon emissions. So we need to measure that, to measure the carbon that is emitted or not emitted and the cost of doing that. But we also need to measure things like you know, new jobs, skills, qualifications, incomes. We need to measure how people's behaviours are changing. So I think one of the challenges with the sustainability process is we kind of expect physical things to somehow do the work for us because the building is more sustainable, the car is more sustainable, the transport is more sustainable, the energy is renewable, but we can kind of carry on doing mm -hmm. what we do. So we also need to measure how people's, how people's behaviour changes. So stop wasting things. Don't travel if you don't have to. Walk, don't drive if you can cycle if you can not everybody can so these kind of behavioral things are also hugely important because we can make physical changes but if we can't change behavior then we're not going to get to the end results so we need ways of measuring that i mean the really challenging thing is you need to change mindset and the psychology of existing in the economy and society and these things are very difficult to measure but we need to behave differently we can regulate people's behavior. We do a lot of work on things like congestion charging, road user pricing, which is a good way to make yourself very unpopular very quickly. Especially in London, you. right? This Although everybody's kind of forgotten about the ULEs now, actually. They're just kind of, well, this is the thing. Just, Have they really forgotten about it? Well, everyone complains. Not actually, everybody doesn't complain. A vocal minority complains. Okay. You hear a lot of noise until it happens and then the vast majority of people just get on with it. You just suck it up, do the British thing. Yeah, but that's <laughs> but these are forms of regulation. Okay. You know, that's quite a specific form of regulation. You need to pay if you have a certain type of vehicle and you're driving in a particular direction. You've got to pay something, okay, and that controls your behaviour. But we also need behaviour to change, which is not necessarily tightly regulated. Mm -hmm. It's it's changing because it's the right thing to do, and this mm. is very difficult to measure. But we have we have to somehow sense that i think in the right way one of the things that fascinates me <coughs> is the major changes in behavior have come over the years through the more of a carrot approach mm -hmm. as opposed to the <coughs> stick approach yeah, so i'll yeah. give you two examples one would be the iphone yeah what has happened with the iphone has changed the way that we listen consume yeah, yeah. music media the way that we talk to people and communicate yeah. and that we connect the other example i'll give is the motor car now Put the CO2 emissions element of yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. but we Henry Ford wasn't after faster horses. He was after a complete shift of thinking in order to get an output. And I'm just wondering here in the pursuit that we have mm. 
of reducing carbon, are we going about it completely the different, completely the wrong way? Yeah. <clears throat> because history has taught us that to change mindsets, we need to play a different game than the one that we're playing at the moment. Um, okay, there's two things there. There's just what you said, change mindset. The other thing is, this needs to go really quickly. We need to make all the difference in the next five years. So 2050 is the target for net, net zero. But if you don't really change things in the next few years, forget 2050. You, you can't, we can't start worrying about this in 2045. It's too late. So we need to move very quickly. So the question then is, OK, can we wait for people to adjust the way they behave naturally? in line with things. So people do, yes, people's behavior does change over time because things get invented and we have to adapt to them. Well, that's that's good, but it might not go fast enough. And if you look at climate change and what it's already doing to places around the world, including here in the UK, we need to move quite quickly. So maybe we need a bit more stick than carrot. We don't, we don't necessarily have the luxury of waiting. Saying that, though, ideally you need to bring people with you. you know, people do need to change their behavior because they feel it's the right thing to do. And they also feel it's within their ability to change. They can control the change. So I think we're going to have to just juggle a lot of this. I thought, you know, it's it's been a little bit too much time, like we're doing right now, sitting, thinking about, oh, why do we do this? When actually we should be just, just getting and just doing get it. on with it. Mm. So you do need a bit mm. of stick and a bit of carrots mm. and just keep juggling, keep trying to balance as we go through because i think you know at wsp we talk about net zero all the time continuously we love net zero we're completely committed but if we were to walk down any street and just talk to people randomly does it mean the same thing to them mm -hmm. i wonder so there's probably a bit to do just in terms of getting into people's minds people now think about the climate maybe in a way they didn't do before because they see it I think that COVID appeared, at least to me, to have a significant change in the way that people viewed their environment, their physical yes. environment. I think it did. I mean, COVID did a few things. I think it changed the way people see their their environment. Yes, their immediate physical environment. People had to because you were stuck in it, so you had to rethink it. Mm. And how easy it is to get to any kind of natural environment, green space. If you have a garden, great. If you don't have a garden, okay, where's your nearest green space? So people had to think through that people also had to think about how they act in the best interests of society so we all had to go and get vaccinated not everybody mm -hmm. got vaccinated mm -hmm. most people did though because mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do as a society to protect ourselves so it i think it did help us maybe see how a kind of mass societal movement in order to achieve the right thing could happen mm -hmm. because it needs government guidance government mm -hmm. leadership mm -hmm. I think, which comes back to this whole point about long term strategic leadership, but we need to move quickly. With that. So with the speed that we need to shift and move, yeah. I am not seeing too many people that really want to make a difference in the uh, environment or live more sustainably or yeah. do something <clears throat> that's going to have an impact on the planet, yeah. shift and move into roles, paid roles, yeah. where they are actually doing that. Yeah. When people are at school, maybe at university, yeah. I'm not seeing any evidence that suggests there's an overwhelming flood of people that want to come into mm -hmm. roles that will have a direct impact on, on, on CO2 yes. emissions and sustainability. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So we did some research about a year and a half ago where we did a big survey of young learners aged 16 to 23, I think they were, for the at school, further education, higher education. And we asked them about green economy transition, how they see green economy, green jobs, green skills, and also what choices they're making about their own careers. And we asked them, thinking about the green transition, what industries do they think are the most important in order to get us to transition to a green economy? And at the top were things like utilities, energy, construction, transport, even agriculture. Okay. Kind of got quite happy. So these are the things people see as important. Then we asked them, what industries are you going to go into? And those industries, which were in the top half, suddenly went down to the bottom half. So transport, construction started to go down to the bottom of the heap. And up at the top, we had medicine, professional services, all very useful. But it was interesting to see that people think they identify what is important, but they don't see themselves in these industries. And I think that's one of the challenges to, to, to get people to see the opportunities 
And, you know, the, there's an opportunity in terms of helping the whole process of change and decarbonisation, getting to net zero. You can play a role in doing that and driving that. But as you do it, you can also get a really good job with prospects that pays well, whether that's in construction, construction management or you know, transport design, whatever it might be. There are good jobs out there with great prospects which will help contribute to the net zero target but young people are not seeing that necessarily seeing a disjoint between what's important what they want to do so that's an education communication process what i see my own students is i see people who are very engaged in these issues in climate the the role of urban places and buildings in addressing climate i see a lot of interest and i think they're going to go into some of these jobs but we need that to be scaled up across the whole country so we need that enthusiasm to be tapped into and steer people in the right direction and to make sure that people know that yes you could go into finance or legal services or marketing or communication or technology yes but you can also go into construction and transport and engineering related to energy and it's just as rewarding in terms of a career, and it's just as rewarding financially. What would you say to persuade a 16-year-old that's just mm. about to do their or finish their GCSEs yeah. to to take on board the things that, that you're saying? Um, I think tapping into you know young a young person's interest in the future of society. Young people have lived through a pandemic. They see war in Europe. They see war in the Middle East. They understand geopolitical tensions so in some ways they're more aware they've been more exposed to challenges and challenges that have affected them covid would have affected their educational experience and we you know we, we would have drifted through ed- education without having to worry nobody worried about pandemic coming we didn't even know what a pandemic was. so there's maybe more exposure more realism about the way the world works now and i think tapping into the need to address that and to create kind of positive societal outcomes so there's almost a kind of philosophical kind of think about the future and your role your contribution in the future there's that dimension but as i've said you can do that and you can get a really well-paid job as you do that Mm -hmm. i think it's, it's these two things coming together so you know working in advanced material science related to construction of new buildings using mmc you know, there'll be fantastic jobs doing that. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, it's construction, it's construction sector. So you can be in the sector, you can be doing a great job, you can be making a difference. And I think that's the kind of bringing these things together will help, I think. Well, Jim, I've enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, we could keep going, I think. I think now we're in a good position to go to the demolition zone. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> So you have created two Ooh, towers yes. here. Yeah. One is slightly taller than the other one, but they're pretty slim. Yeah. What do they represent? What do they represent? Okay, so I've got two myths to bust. So one is because we talked a lot about labor force skills in construction. And I think there's still a bit of a myth that construction as an industry, it's, you know, the jobs are a bit dirty. They're outdoors, they're a bit old fashioned. It's all middle aged men, which is partly true, actually. Aging workforce. Whereas actually, I think the jobs in construction are, you know, that they're evolving and changing very rapidly because of the need to decarbonize buildings that we build new, but also the existing building stock. There's huge numbers of new jobs which, you know, are available to people, young and old. We need to get the training structures maybe right, a little bit better, improved. But I think it's a myth to think that jobs in construction are not interesting, dynamic, changing, well paid a lot of the time and just help with the whole process of getting to net zero. So I think that's a myth which is kind of in the process of changing, but we need to change it more and we need to address it because we need to make the workforce more diverse as well because diversity breeds creativity in my experience. Well, I have a very diverse team now, people from all different backgrounds, different countries, different cultural traditions, different ethnicities. It's not the first time I've had a very diverse team like this, but I, I've also had teams which are not so diverse, a bit more homogenous, but I do see a greater degree of creative creativity, different ways of thinking, blending different ways of thinking together, different ways of seeing the world, which is just much more interesting and more effective because if you're delivering a service to the world, you need to see the world in all of its different forms, Mm. really. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. 
part of that. Second Tower, what does that Second represent? Second Tower is a bit more specific, a bit more technical. We've been doing a lot of work at the moment looking at net zero housing. And I think the myth there is that net zero housing requires really complex, sophisticated new forms of construction, modern methods of construction. <laughs> All a bit difficult, isn't it? And I think that's a myth because we've seen examples of where fairly traditional standard building processes, construction processes, can be used to build net zero housing under certain circumstances with a certain type of developer, certain type of property owner, but using the existing supply chain, maybe deepening those supply chain relationships, taking things to you know an extra degree of specification. But it doesn't necessarily require, you know, forms of building which people think are kind of outside of you know their reach at the moment we can move forward with what we've got right now we you know we will probably move to more sophisticated forms of construction as we go but there's net zero projects we could be getting on with if the circumstances are right so it's not a myth yeah we've got two for one yeah do i have to do them now you've time? cleared both of them up Right. I'll let you decide how you demolish them. Well, I think, first of all, we, my engineering colleagues would say, before you do this demolition, have you thought about the embodied carbon in this structure? So we just need to pretend we've thought about that. To see them all. <laughs> yeah, so again, Away you go. <laughs> nice. I love there that. The last question. What is one thing that everyone can do that would make the most difference? The one thing that everyone can do? Stop buying stuff you don't need. Don't buy. If you don't need it, don't buy it. If you're only going to wear it once, don't buy it. Love it. Jim, it's been great having you on it's the been show. Great being here. Thank you. I've, I've loved listening to your perspective, your wisdom. I could have spoken to you for a, at least another hour. Maybe we'll have to do a round right, two at some point. Do it again. But okay. thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like you to do me a favor, and I don't mean here just to ask you to subscribe and to follow, but what I'd really like you to do is to share this podcast with as many people as you think would benefit from it. I would love to maintain the quality of people that are joining me on this podcast, and so in order for me to do that, I really need your help. It could be somebody that's looking to get into an industry, but they're not quite sure what industry they want to get into. Maybe it's a teenager that is just finishing their GCSEs or starting A-levels. Maybe it's somebody that's doing an English degree at university, but is not quite sure what they want to do with that degree. So I invite you just to share this podcast with as many people that you know, so that we can grow this community, so that we can maintain the quality, engaging conversations that we're having together. Thank you for your help.